The human skeleton is initially made up of cartilage and fibrous membranes, but, but bone is soon going to replace most of these early support. So what we're going to see as bone develop develops again is that bones are going to replace cartilage. And the few cartilages that remain in adults are going to be found in certain areas where we still need to have some sort of flexible skeletal tissue. So when we think of skeletal cartilages, first of all, they're going to be considered to be avascular. So they're going to take a long time to heal. And um, the nerve supply also is, uh, is very, it's sparse, it's, in, it's not innervated. So when we think of, of cartilage, what we think of is a dense connective tissue layer, uh, a membrane which is called a perichondrium. And the perichondrium lit literally means around the cartilage. And this pericardium, or this perichondrium rather, is going to resist outward expansion when the cartilage is going to be compressed. And so the three major types of cartilage that we're going to talk about are the hyaline cartilage, the elastic cartilage and also the fibrocartilage and you'll need to be able to identify these in your lab as well and you should know the main locations of where they are where they're found and also what their major functions are going to be our next slide is showing hyaline cartilage and hyaline cartilage is going to provide support flexibility and also resilience and the different examples of hyaline cartilage, uh, they're named based on where they're going to be located. So articular cartilage is a type of hyaline cartilage, and it's going to be found mainly at, mainly at joints, and it's going to be at the ends of long bones. There's also costal cartilage, which is going to be located between the ribs as well as the sternum. There is respiratory cartilage, again a subtype of hyaline cartilage and nasal cartilage found in the nose. The respiratory cartilage is mainly found in the larynx. So the hyaline cartilage is the most abundant type that we have. The elastic cartilage is what's going to contain the elastin fibers, the elastic fibers, and it's going to be located in places of the body where we need to have repeated bending. Then fibrocartilage is going to be the strongest type of cartilage, and it's going to be found in the menisci of the knees. It's also going to be in the intervertebral discs, so between the vertebrae. And the other location that we find it is in the fibrocartilage pad between the coxal bones called the pubic symphysis. So the next slide that we have is showing a diagram that you have in your textbook and again you need to know where these are located and we see the orange bones are going to be primarily referring to the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton has 80 bones in it and the rest of the bones are the appendicular skeleton and in this case we have a total of 126 bones in the appendicular skeleton. Now the growth of cartilage, um, the first type of growth is called appositional growth and this term actually means growth from outside. And in this case what's going to happen is that these cartilage cells are going to scrape new matrix against the external face of the existing cartilage which is also there. There's also interstitial growth and this type of growth is termed growth from the inside. And in this case there are lacunae bound chondrocytes that divide and secrete new matrix expanding the cartilage from within. Now as we get older it's possible that calcification of cartilage does occur. This occurs during, during normal bone growth and old age. 
But one important thing for you to understand is that calcified cartilage, again, is when the cartilage itself is going to calcify, but it is not the same thing as bone tissue. Remember that these are two separate types of connective tissue that you learned about in chapter four. Now, when we classify the different types of bones, there are certainly many, many bones in our body. There are 206 total bones, um, 80 of which, remember, are axial, and the other 126 are appendicular. We can all classify these into four different shapes. Uh, we first of all have the long bone. The long bone would be things like the humerus, the uh, femur, the lower leg bone, which is the tibia, the fibula, there's no such thing as a fibia, the ulna, as well as the radius. These are all long bones. Letter B is the irregular bones. These would include things like the coxal bones, which are the hip bones, and also the vertebrae that you can see here. So whether it's cervical, lumbar, thoracic, they're all classified as irregular bones. And then flat bones, flat bones a lot of times are gonna be slightly curved. Um, the classic examples are gonna be the skull bones. But these um, other examples of flat bones are also going to include things like the sternum, the shoulder blades, and the shoulder blades would be things like they're called the scapulae. And the sternum that you see here would include the body of the sternum as well as the manubrium and the xiphoid process, which is this region here, the xiphoid process. And you'll be learning these more specifically in chapter seven. Short bones are going to be kind of rounded bones. One example of a short bone is a sesamoid bone because it looks like a sesame seed. And it's actually embedded in a tendon. And the one example of, this, of a sesame, sesamoid bone that we have is our patella. We also have the ankle bones like the talus bone, a bone called the calcaneus, as well as our wrist bones, which are called the carpals. So the carpals and the tarsals. And one of the tarsals names would be the talus bone. Now there are several different functions of bones there. First of all is support and protection. And both of these are going to be functions predominantly of the axial skeleton. So if we think about supporting soft organs like the heart and the lungs, also protecting these important organs would be a function of the axial skeleton. When we think of movement, this applies to the appendicular skeleton, the ability of our muscles to have something to be attached to, to act as levers. This would be locomotion of our, within our environment, also the ability to actually pick or grasp something. The next few functions are going to include things like mineral and growth storage. Two of the important minerals that are gonna be stored are calcium and phosphate. You can think of the bone as kind of a storage area where withdrawals of calcium or deposits of calcium can be made. And we use this analogy later when we talk about osteoblasts and osteoclast function. Blood cell formation is called hematopoiesis, so where red blood cells are formed. But then unfortunately as we age, we are going to find fat in the yellow bone marrow. And then one of the additional functions of the bone is going to be hormone production. And one of the important hormones that is going to play a role in actually obesity, glucose intolerance, diabetes mellitus, would be osteocalcin. And you're gonna learn more about osteocalcin next semester in anatomy and physiology too. So our next slide is showing bony landmarks. We'll get back to the slide in just a little bit. But first of all, we need to talk about the, the um, two different types of bones. There is compact bone, and there's also spongy bone. Compact bone contains a important part, which we call the, the osteons. And the osteon would be the functional unit of the compact bone. 
The spongy bone has bone that has what are called trabeculae within them, or trabecular bone. Now, a, an irregular bone, or a flat or short bone, is going to resemble this structure that you see here, the, stru the picture that you have in your book. And this type of bone is, um, has spongy bone within it. In spongy bone, it's specifically called diploi. And diploi um, would be the very center of the spongy of this spongy bone, and it is surrounded by two layers of compact bone, which you can see here. So it's almost like the diploi is sandwiched in between the compact bones. So the structure that we see here of this type of bone is that the periosteum is going to be on the outside, uh, the endosteum the inner membrane is going to be covered with um, it's, it's covering the spongy bone that is within. The spongy bone is called the diploi and the bone marrow is actually found between the trabeculae and the trabeculae are going to be referring to this honeycomb structure. It's called trabecular bone so again trabecular bone is basically the same thing as spongy bone and the word trabeculae is actually referring to little beams so little beams that are filled with red or yellow bone marrow so the main type of bone then uh, would be the long bone so there's the four different categories based on shape the long bone is going to include the structures that you see on your slide here so you should be aware of these structures for both lecture and lab and there's a tubular diaphysis which is the shaft of the bone and in this case this is where we find the marrow and the marrow is going to be yellow marrow which is where fat is found so it contains the yellow marrow cavity within the medullary cavity which is lined by an inner membrane called the endosteum so endo means sort of within and the periosteum would be the outer membrane which is along the perimeter of the bone and then the ends of the bones are called the epiphyses so singular would be an epiphysis and they are named for where they're located in, in relationship to the joint. So we use the term proximal or distal, the directional terms. And a thin layer of hyaline cartilage is going to be covering this end of the bone. So again, articular cartilage is primarily located in joints. And remember that it is an example of hyaline cartilage. Between the diaphysis and the epiphyses, we find an epiphyseal line. And the epiphyseal line is actually left over from the epiphyseal plate, which is the growth plate. But once ossification occurs, once a person reaches adulthood, then the epiphyseal plate develops into the epiphyseal line. So our next slide is now showing some of the membranes of the bone, which you saw on the previous slide. And these membranes are going to include, first of all, this double layer membrane called the periosteum. And the periosteum is covering the external surface of the bone. So it's the outer layer. And again, there it's, sub, it's a double layer, but it's on the outside of the bone. But it's a double layer. The external layer is going to be the fibrous layer and the fibrous layer is really dense irregular connective tissue. Recall from chapter 5 that you learned that uh, dense irregular connective tissue is also going to be found in the dermis. The inner layer is going to be called the osteogenic layer so it's where growth is actually going to occur and it has what are called stem cells. These are stem cell cells that can develop into other types of cells and 
Um, these stem cells are going to give rise to all other bone cells except for bone destroying cells. And um, some of these cells would be things like the osteoblast, for example. Um, so this osteoblast means basically to build or to form. They're going to be very important cells. We also have nerve fibers, uh, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels that really have to be passing into the shaft for development of the marrow cavity. And this passes through what's called the nutrient foramina. And a foramina is a small hole for a blood vessel to pass through. And that would be where this nutrient artery passes through. And then there are collagen fibers, which are called perforating fibers, which are going to secure the fibrous layer uh, in the bone matrix, secure the periosteum itself, the outer membrane, to the underlying bone. So these, perf these Sharpies or perforating fibers are shown right here. Then the delicate interconnected tissue membrane is the endosteum again. This means within the bone, and this covers the internal bone surface, covers the trabeculae of the spongy bone. And it also contains osteogenic cells that can differentiate as well. And again, remember that the compact bone, one of its uh, structural components, is going to be the osteon. Now within the bone, remember one of its function is hematopoiesis. So there is a location for hematopoietic tissue, red marrow, and this red marrow is typically found within the trabecular cavities, specifically of the heads of the long bones, so the heads of the femur and the humerus. And also there are trabecular cavities found within the diploid of flat bones as well. In most adult bones, the fat-containing medullary cavity is going to extend within to the epiphysis, and there's very little red marrow that's actually present then in spongy bones. So as we, as we continue to age, so as we get older, what is going to happen is that the red marrow is slowly going to be converted to yellow marrow. So there's less and less of the skeleton that's going to be responsible for, the, for producing the red marrow that we, we need. So this slide is showing some of the major cells, the microscopic anatomy of the bone. And there are five major cell types that populate bone tissue. There are osteogenic cells, which are the stem cells. So these stem cells are going to have the ability to develop into other cells. That's what a stem cell is. Then we have the osteoblast. And the osteoblast is the bone forming cell. Remember that's what the suffix means. So they're the bone forming cells. And they're going to be actually secreting the matrix that's responsible for bone, bone growth. And the, um, they secrete the matrix, which is going to include things like collagen. So there's a lot of collagen, which is going to be responsible for the hardness of the bone itself. Um, they're going to produce calcium binding proteins that make up the, un, the initial unmineralized bone. And that's going to be a substance called the osteoid. And then the next type of cell that we actually have is called the osteocyte. And the osteocyte is going to be the mature type of bone. And it's going to occupy a space called the lacuna. So again, it's mature bone, and it's going to be in a space called the lacuna. And what it does is it's going to be monitoring and maintaining bone matrix. So they kind of act as stress sensors and either trigger bone formation or bone deposition. They communicate this information to other cells. 
that are responsible for this this happening with osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. And what's interesting is these projections that you see from them, uh, these spidery projections, these are going to extend into canals, which are called the canaliculi canals. And then another type of cell that we have is the osteoclast cell. And these are actually going to differentiate into macrophages. But what they're important for is bone resorption. And bone resorption really means bone breaking down. So what's going to happen is these cells are going to absorb extracellular matrix and destroy bone so that bone can be replaced. So the last part of your chapter, or not last part of your chapter, but the last part of this little mini lecture is going to be on the bone markings. And these are important bone markings that you need to know. And you need to know this table. So this table is nicely broken down into projections that are sites for muscles and ligament attachments. Remember that's one of the important functions of the skeletal system. And first of all we see a tuberosity. And at this point you only need to know the examples on this chart. So the ischial tuberosity is where a bone is or a muscle is going to be attached like the gluteal muscles then we also have a crest and the one crest you need to know at this point is a very important crest called the iliac crest then you need to know trochanters and one important trochanter to know uh, there's a bunch of trochanters located on the femur that we find here uh, you need to recognize the term line and um, one of the lines is intertrochanteric inter line, and it's called this because it's located between the trochanters. We also have a tubercle. An example of a tubercle to know at this point would be the adductor tubercle, but there's also tubercles that you're going to be learning in Chapter 7 that are located on the humerus. There are also epicondyles. Epicondyles are bumps that are on top of condyles. And so the condyle would be just distal to this epicondyle. And then there's a spine and a process. A process would be something like the spinous process. And then a spine would be something like the ischial spine. And again, you'll be learning other examples of these. But for now, these are the examples you need to know for chapter 6. And then our next slide is grouping other bone markings into projections that form joints and depressions and openings. Um, and so again, these are some of the examples that you should know. The head, facet, condyle, ramus. And then one of the openings that you've already been, list, been introduced to is called the foramina, the nutrient foramina, which is just a small foramen. But foramen are very important. They're holes in bones where a blood or blood vessel or nerve can go through. And then you need to know the others that are listed here. Now on a previous slide, uh, back here, you saw these listed as well. So this sort of goes along with that important table that we just looked at.